I recommend that you open up a Tehillim which has the trop in it. The trop, uh, in Hebrew we call it Tamim, which is the same Hebrew word for tastes or reasons, are those notes, the other marks that you see along with the regular Nikudot, the vowels. <clears throat> the same sources of tradition that passed on what the vowels should be, you know, when you write Hebrew there's no written vowels, especially in a scroll. It's tradition what vowels should be there, how to pronounce it. The same traditions were written down by, by these people about how to inflect, how to group the words, how to punctuate them. That's what the trump is. Okay? So you should have trump in, in, your, in what you're studying because the trump actually tells you how to read what you see there according to tradition. And if you were to remove the trump and just look at the scroll, you might be able to say, hey, I think I should be break apart the words this way or some other way. Just like if you were to take away the, the nikudot, you could possibly read certain words differently, change their tense, change their gender, change their entire meaning from vowels, uh, from, let's say, verbs to nouns. That could happen just by changing a simple vowel. Okay? So that, that's very colons? important. What? Are you talking about the colon? You're, it shouldn't have colons. Colons is a very Western thing. I came from English. In Hebrew, there are no colons. If it looks like a colon, that means the end of a pasuk. Okay? In, in trop, what looks like a colon, two vertical dots in, at the end of a word, okay, that are, are not below a letter nor above a letter, that, that colon-like thing is the equivalent of an English period. Okay? That's, a, that's, that's how we always mark a pasuk in Tanakh. Most of the other books of the Bible, there are 21 books according to Jew Jewish tradition, uh, sorry, 24 books, 21 of them have regular trop. The Bible is poetic. It is not mu necessarily musical, it is not necessarily prose, it is written poetic form. Okay? If you've read enough Bible, you'd see that. It's, it has this poetic sound to it. Some traditions, uh, some tra translations, have attempted to preserve this poetic form to it, most notably the King James Version. Okay? It has a Shakespearean poetic sound to it, correct? Uh, three books of the Bible are even more musical than the others. Those are Eov, Job, Tehillim, which we're looking at now, the Psalms, and uh, Mishlei, Proverbs. Okay? They have a different trup system, which is more specific than the trup system that the regular Bible uses. Okay? The regular Bible has basically one way to divide up a sentence. Groupings of, letter, groupings of words based on where the middle of the sentence should be, the pasuk should be, and subdividing. That's it. Dividing everything in half. And dividing the halves in half when necessary. That's how it works. But for Tilim, Mishle, and Eov, the uh, acronym Eov, Mishle, Tehillim, spell Emet, the books of truth, uh, there's more to that. They, these were meant to be sung, and therefore uh, not every pasuk is divided up the same way. There's some verses are divided up in one way, others in another. We'll see. Uh, when we get to our first example, how that works. Uh, the trup is, most people do not know how to use the trup. I think it is wrong to use, let's say, a version of the Tehillim that has it broken up by someone else. They put in the colons or commas for you, and they took out the trup, because you're rely relying on their interpretation of what the trup means. You shouldn't rely on someone else's interpretation, just like I don't recommend we use a translation for this class, because then you're relying on what the translator thinks it should mean. Instead, we're going to look at the actual word and try to break it apart and see what possible translations could be given, what has been suggested. But we're not going to stick with one translation. We're not going to force interpretation onto a verse. Unless, of course, we have a positive rabbinical tradition that that's what it is supposed to mean. If the rabbis told us this is what the verse means, then it is our obligation to follow that. Uh, the rabbis told us an eye for an eye does not mean you should punish someone who knocks out someone's eye by knocking out his eye. Jews have never practiced such a thing, even the olden days. We don't have any report of that's what it meant. Yes, death penalty is literal, but an eye for an eye refers to what? Monetary restitution, right? You can even, if you look closely, you can even understand that from the many verses that say that. So too, we were just seeing before, last week's Parsha, the, when it says a Sabbath day, a Shabbat, it doesn't always refer to Saturday. It refers to what we call Yom Tov, holidays where you're not allowed to do work, just like on a Shabbat. So because you can't do work on those days, it's also called a Sabbath. There are old schools of thought 
uh, heretical schools of thought, we used to call them Sadducees, Karaites, people like that, who claim that when it says Shabbat, it literally means Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, but it doesn't refer to, let's say, holidays. Okay? That's why they're counting Omer differently than we, not this year, but most years their Sefirat Omer always starts on the Sunday. This year, Sefirat Omer happens to start on the Sunday. They would always start on the Sunday, and their Shavuot would always fall out on the Sunday, by rule, because of their interpretation. So we must follow the rabbinical tradition. The trump that I've been talking about is the rabbinical tradition about how to break apart the word, the, the, the psukim into psukim, and within the, those psukim, how to break them apart into phrases, etc. That is a positive tradition that we must preserve, and we should also understand. Now, uh, a brief word about the author of this book. Like most books of Tanakh, this book wasn't written one day by one person. It is assumed that even the first five books of Tanakh, the Pentateuch, what we call Torah, the five books of Moses, as I'll point out, Moses didn't sit down and write that all from scratch one day before he died, but rather was writing it down as he went along. He even incorporated things, old traditions or old texts, that had been in our possession before that. Okay? That's, that's mentioned by Chazal in a few places. Even the book of Numbers, that's uh, Bamidbar, it's mentioned that this is written elsewhere in some other book, like the book of the Wars of Hashem is mentioned. That's a book that was used as a source text for the Torah. Correct? And there are parts of the Torah that have been taken out and put in other books, quoted. That's why sometimes you'll find the Navi, it says so-and-so in the Torah, and there's lists you can find in the back of good uh, books of Tanakh, which will, which will show you the parallels, where one book of Tanakh is paraphrasing, sometimes even taking verbatim from an earlier book. Okay? So these books have been put together over time. Tehillim, Psalms, is generally credited to King David, because a lot of the Psalms actually say of David, he wrote this, or they describe events and personalities with which David was familiar, or they even go so far as to describe what David was thinking and feeling during events recorded in other books of the Bible. Okay? Samuel, the book of Samuel is mostly about David. Why is it called Samuel? That's a good question. That's Shmuel Aleph and Shmuel Bet, but it's mostly about King David. There's another book of the Bible, uh, Chronicles, the first half is also mostly about King David. And the book of Chronicles and the book of Samuel shed light on what we're going to read in Tehillim. We also see in Tehillim that there are some chapters written by people other than King David, colleagues of his. Asaf is an example. Haman, Yeduthun, these are people who are mentioned in other books of the Bible as having dealings with David. They were musicians, and they were composers, and they wrote psalms that made it into our book. Moses wrote a psalm in our book, maybe a few. There's one that says Moses wrote this one. Okay? It didn't get into the Torah because it wasn't saying that God dictated and told him to put in the Torah. It is something else entirely. And there are even some psalms that they say were written much later in history. And therefore, we could say the whole book was eventually put together sometime in early Second Temple times by the men of the Great Assembly. That's when the book, they stopped adding to the book around then, and that's when it was sealed. We even have a psalm written by King Solomon also, that we'll see all of these. There's quite a few authors here. The entire Tanakh is divided into three. We have Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Nevi'im are books written by the prophets who had direct messages from God, whatever that means, by the way. What exactly prophecy is is a little bit confusing. Those men wrote down their books. They all fit into one category. You're familiar with the books of the, of the prophets. Some of them are history books. Some of them are actual books of prophecies. Okay? The first group, they normally say, those are the, the history books starting from Judges. No, sorry, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. Those are history books. The other books, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the latter 12 prophets, those are less stories and more records of prophecies. Then we have something called the Ketuvim, literally that which has been written, or the writings. Where do those fit in? If they had been written by the prophets or on the same level as the other books, 
So we would, we would figure they just lump them in the prophets. Why is there this distinction? So Rambam, that's Maimonides, says that there are some people who either were not actually prophets, but were highly inspired and just missed being full-fledged prophets, and therefore their works are concerned on the same level as actual prophecy, or there are things written by the prophets that were written when the prophets themselves were not on their high prophetic levels. That's where the Ketuvim fit in. David and Solomon wrote a number of books. Okay, So David wrote the Psalms. We credit Solomon with the Shir Shirim, that's Song of Songs. We credit him with the Mishlei Proverbs and Koheleth, which is Ecclesiastes. Correct? But these two kings are not prophets, and therefore their books don't get into the prophetic books. Same thing, Samuel was a prophet. They credit him with writing Ruth, for example. But Ruth was written on a different way than Samuel, so it's lumped in the Ketuvim. Moses himself, as we said, wrote the Torah. He was the greatest of prophets. But even one thing that he wrote, possibly he wrote Eov. Maimonides says we don't know who wrote Eov. The fact that there are so many opinions about when it was written and who wrote it indicate that no one actually knows for sure because then we would know. They wouldn't have such radically different opinions about how it happened. Uh, that being the case, even though Moses was the greatest prophet, still that which he could write would end up in the Ketuvim. Okay? Also, this explains why Daniel, he's not a prophet, even though there's a lot of predictions about the future written in his book, like when possibly the world is supposed to come to an end, the Messiah is supposed to come, they say those are in his book. That's not so clear. And the sages understood that his book doesn't get into that category. It's lumped in the Ketuvim. What book did he write? Well, Daniel. It's called Daniel. The book of Daniel is about Daniel. It's about his, you know, wrote it. Yeah. Later people would claim Noah was actually put to writing later. Um, it's a very cryptic book. Some have tried to, every, every time someone tries to fit some great event to the words, of, to, the, to the things described in Daniel. They want to say that Daniel actually just predicts the Maccabean revolt. And everything that's described in there is, is uh, the succession of kingdoms after the Babylonian Empire, the rise of the Greeks, and eventually the fall of the Seleucids, those are the, the, the Assyrian Greeks, Antiochus and people like that, at the hands of the Maccabees. But the problem is you could then easily say that describes other later events. It's very cryptic. And which is why they say you shouldn't uh, try looking in too deeply into that book because you're just going to mess yourself up. What? Okay, Daniel, book of Daniel. Now we are looking at Tilim. We said David Amel is not considered a prophet. Okay. What is what was so great about David Amelech? It says that he was a singer. That's in Samuel. He wrote songs. Naim Zimi wrote Israel, commonly translated as the sweet singer of Israel. That's what he liked to do in his spare time. We're going to see there's some Tehillim where he says he was forced to make war for whatever reason. He had to protect the Jews, and he was good at that, and that's what God chose him for. But what he really would like to do is actually sit around and discuss Torah. We're going to see the first Tehillim. That's, he uses a lot of uh, synonyms for what we call Torah. God's judgments, God's testimonies, God's word. That's what he really liked. And he liked to sit around praising God and composing songs, which is also very nice. Solomon did the same thing. He followed in his footsteps. The Gemara says that David, well, the, 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 the Tanakh records this, King David had many wives. The Gemara claims total of 18. Okay? No. Eight, 18 wives. Okay? No, Solomon had 1,000. Okay? A lot more than that. It says he had 18 wives, and uh, this is also explicit. Many, he had many sons. Many of them had a claim that they were a firstborn. Many of them had a claim that they were more fit to be king than others. Many uh, even tried to seize the the throne while David was still alive. One even apparently tried to take it from Solomon after King David had passed on. Okay? He had many sons of many different ages who potentially could have been king. It wasn't so clear, by the way, who gets to be king. It's not necessarily the firstborn. It has to be the one who's fit, correct? Or maybe the one who God chooses. David himself was not a firstborn. None of our uh, patriarchs were firstborns. As a matter of fact, the entire book of Genesis 
as a running theme that the firstborn is always rejected and replaced by a younger brother. And this is true for every single personality we meet in the book of Genesis who has a brother. You can go look through it. Who's, who's our, for the first brothers? No, Cain and Hevel. Cain kills Hevel, and Cain's rejected by God, and the third son, Seth, is the ancestor of everybody else. Okay? We don't know of Noah's brothers. Noah has three sons. Who's the oldest son? Japheth. It says Shem is written, but then it says an explicit puzzle. Japheth was two years older than Shem. Who's the chosen one? Shem. Shem. Next. Avram Vinu had who? Terach had, had three sons. Nahor, Avram, and Terach. Avram, an older brother called Nahor. Okay? Haran was killed. Okay? Wait, Terach wasn't the father? Terach was, sorry. Terach had three sons. Nahor, Avram, and Haran. Haran died. Avram was the second one. Avram was chosen. Avram Avinu had Ishmael, who was then not chosen by God even after he was born. God said it's going to be the next son, Yitzchak. Yitzchak had two sons. His oldest was Esav, and the younger was Yaakov, and who was chosen? Yaakov. Yaakov. Esav was rejected. That's also an explicit pasuk. Yaakov had a firstborn called Ruvain. Ruvain was rejected. There's a few psukim about that for whatever reason. And his privileges were given to his younger brother Yehuda, who was three sons below him. Correct? Three brothers. Or Levi, who was two below him. Or Yosef, who was the second to last son. Correct? All those privileges were given over. Yosef had two sons, Menashe and Ephraim. Yaakov said, who takes precedence? Ephraim over Menashe. Switch the hands. Ephraim is, is, the, is the better one. That is the running theme. Aaron himself doesn't, is, is older than Moses, and Moses ends up also. And uh, then we see that when the Torah was given, who did the, the Jews worship the golden calf, unfortunately, and all the firstborn are rejected in favor of the Levites. Correct? Aaron's oldest two sons themselves are killed on their first day of the job. And the kahuna goes through the line of their third son. Yeah, no, this is Literally. this is this is a crucial and emphasis on the Torah. Evan ma'asuha bonim hayethal rosh pinad. The rock, the stone that was rejected by the builders. Correct. This is in Hallel. David was they say was describing himself. Became the cornerstone. King David was the youngest of his brothers, and he was chosen for, to be king. Correct. Solomon was chosen also. He had many older brothers. God chose Solomon explicitly. He sent the, the, the prophet to say, David's heir will be Solomon. The Gemara says that Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. It says that King David had many worthy wives, most worthy of them, Abigail, Abigail. They say that she was a prophetess. The Gemara's example is, if King David wanted to have many more wives, even if they were all Abigail's, he couldn't do such a thing. That's an example of his best wife. But her son also was not chosen to be king. It says that Solomon's mother, one of King David's latter wives, said all the other queens are pray that God gives them a son who's fit to be king. I pray for a son who's fit to be a prophet. Okay? That's what King David was aspiring to. When it says that King Solomon, there are verses about this also, you've been told Solomon was the wisest of all men, it doesn't mean he knew how to build rocket ships, except he didn't have the technology around where no one else to work with. It doesn't mean he was a biologist. It doesn't mean he was a mathematician. It means, in context, if you read it, it means that, like King David, he was a gifted musical, uh, he was a gifted musician and poet. Okay, that's what's clear. It says he was even bigger than all the other Jewish musicians and poets. It mentions guys that David involved with, Haman, Asaf, Giduthun. And he was even better than the Babylonian ones and the Egyptian ones. Because in Babylon and Egypt, and places like that, where they cultural, you know, they also uh, had, had an idea that music and, and poetry are higher art forms. Solomon was the best, was better than all of them. And that's what it means he was wise. And it also explains why, just like King David was the best musician, he gave us the book of Psalms, so too his son gave us a number of great works of poetry and music. Yes? Why is music and poetry like the ultimate wisdom? We're going to see that. That is why we're studying this. Music and poetry are the ultimate wisdom because they result from prophetic inspiration. When a person, there's, Maimonides writes, you can be really smart and you can work on yourself and you can become really smart. 
a prophet first has to be very wise and then has to put himself in a good mood and open up what he calls the imaginative faculty, what we call imagination. Stam, if you just imagine things, you're just making stuff up. That's being grounded in reality. A prophet, in order to tap into uh, the ultimate intellect, godly intellect, and know ultimate truths without having any prior knowledge, a prophet can tell you what's beyond that wall. Correct? If God tells him, a prophet can tell you what will happen tomorrow without knowing what will really be. How? He combines his perfected intellectual faculties with his imagination. And the only way he can do that is through music. When the imagination and the music just flow, then you can tap into higher knowledge. This is something we believe. There's also, it's, uh, it's one of the animamims. We believe that God gives his word to people. It's in the Mishnah Torah. It's in, there's a lot of books written about this. Jews have yet to have not produced a proper prophet for a few thousand years. It's also explicit in other books of the Bible that when prophets wanted to get in the prophetic mood, they would start playing music. Think Karl Gott type of people, hippies. They would sit down and start playing music. It's actually explicit. King David would take his harp, and that's how he would get his inspiration and start writing this. Okay? He would use music. Other prophets, Elisha, that was Eliyahu Anavi's student, also got in a bad mood. He got angry. He said, get me my harp. I have to get back in the mood. King Saul, he also encountered people who would try to attain this level of prophecy by first composing music. If you can, who composed music? Okay, when, we, when we talk about Shira in the Bible, who does it say that they, they sang something and then we have a song <laughs> written by someone? Who wrote our songs? Miriam? Yeah, it says Miriam did this, Moses, Az Yashir Moshe. Okay? Devorah? It says Devorah wrote a song. Yeah, it's similar. We write similar. King David has a song in there. It says God saved them. The inspiration that the Jews had at the sea was such that even a slave woman saw more than Ezekiel saw. That's how they were able, as a group, to start singing Az Yashir. And in that song, we know there's allusions to the future. Okay? You don't even know. If a person was, is, is prophesizing, as they say, he's saying what's going to be, he doesn't even know it. He doesn't realize the full extent to what he's saying. Okay? The music encodes wisdom that we can only see when we analyze it later. Okay? It's a... Uh, yeah, it's actually pretty cool. So the people, people have not achieved this. There, Rav Cook had a student, the the Nazir, uh, Rabbi David Hakohen. He became a Nazir, and he spent his days trying to achieve this level, trying to uh, get uh, divine inspiration. Any questions until now? No. no. Okay. Music is very important. You cannot. Uh, what? I have a question. Yeah. What's the significance of Tehillim? Because isn't it just, you could say, like, so King David and whoever else wrote it, it's just their feelings and whatever it is, but what's the significance to us if it's just... They granted us this book so that we could study it and enjoy their wisdom. It would make us wise also. That's the first thing. We are opening this up because we want to understand what the great people personalities of old understood. We want to think like they did. We want to have a relationship with God like they did. A person who is close to God enjoys godly protection. That's what we're going to read. Uh, the, the, second, the second psalm that we're going to read, uh, that's tomorrow. Psalm 18 is actually about that. David Melech was such a man of faith. If you read this, his stories, he had people trying to kill him all the time. He went up against kings. Jewish kings tried to kill him and Jewish armies. Foreign kings and foreign armies tried to kill him. He had to always fight. His own family was at one point against him. Later, his own children were against him. But because he had so much trust in God, not faith in God, he had so much trust in God that God will save him and keep his promise, he survived all these things through 